A good craftsperson never blames their tools. And as audio folk, it's tempting because we see mastering studios with really cool hardware gear and we wish we could get our hands on it. And if we don't have our hands on it, we're blaming the fact that we're not getting the same quality as that because we don't have this analog gear. Hell, even I'm a victim to this now, even that I know better, I'm still on Vintage King scrolling through gear. I was just doing that earlier this morning, but I wanted to prove something about digital only mastering. So I challenged my good friend, Will Borza over at Borza Mastering to master a song only using analog. And in this same video, I'm gonna master the same song only using digital. Now, both of us typically master in hybrid using both analog and digital tools. So when I pitched him that he could only use analog and I could only use digital, he felt as though he got the shorter end of the stick. I'm not gonna lie, I feel a little bit like I'm at a disadvantage here. And to be true, he actually did. The digital world offers so much more flexibility, but this isn't a case of competing two masters. But for me, at least, uh, my aim is to showcase the critical thinking and knowledge you need with your tools to get the best results. And that high and analog gear isn't the be all and end all for masters. Mastering. Hell, even both Will and I agree that it's a luxury to our workflows and not a necessity, and it isn't uncommon for either of us to be mastering completely in the box because it can be a more appropriate approach at times. Now, before we jump in, I'm going to play you a total of 32 bars. Eight bars will be a raw mix, eight bars will be one of the masters, another eight bars will be the raw mix, and another eight bars will be another one of the masters. I'm going to ask you to leave your comment in the section below to see which you think is the analog, which you think is the digital, which you think sounds better or worse and then I'm going to jump straight into the video. This song is It's Gonna Be Alright by the artists Casey Lipka and Leo Costa. Let's set up our session in our DAW. I'm using Pro Tools. If you're using any other DAW, it'll work and operate exactly the same. What we're gonna need is two stereo tracks. One is gonna be our pitch and the other one is gonna be our capture track. And then obviously just a master channel where, which I've already got set up here where we can do some metering. So this will be our pitch, we'll call this pitch. And the capture, I tend to name after the actual track. So when it captures it, it writes to the file name, the name of the track. So this would be the artist who is, let me go back here, Casey Limpner and Leo Costa. So CL underscore LC, it's gonna be all right. Okay, and this is at uh, 96K, 24 bit I'll be exporting it at. Okay, that goes there, pitch. The output to here, bus seven and eight, becomes the input of the capture channel. So it goes, leaves this channel and enters this one, which means it'll be in safe solo and input only monitoring. And in addition to that, I'm gonna add another stereo track as a compare channel. So I've got a pitch, a capture, so we'll go pitch, capture, compare. Those are the three main channels and you can do that in any DAW, simple routing. In the compare, we sit the original mix. In the pitch, we send sit the original mix. And in the capture, that's where we record the final master into um, in real time. That's just how I work, digital or analog. I like to listen through everything start to end and allows me to edit the ins and out points. But I've just got these eight bars for the sake, or not these eight bars, four bars for the sake of this exercise. So now to get set up, I have that mix in Isotope Audio Editor. There's a few things I wanna see. I wanna see my peak value, which is zero, well, it's basically zero decibels, 0, 0.04, so zero decibels. I'd label that always in my pitch. I like to look at the overall loudness. It's already at 14.1 as a mix integrated. So that gives me a crest factor of 14.1. 
Um, and then I like to note the loudest short term moment, which is at two seconds. So those first three seconds of the song is where the most energy actually is. So let's go grid mode. We're going to change grid mode to minutes and seconds here. And we're just going to take these first three seconds of the track. If I go into minutes and seconds, there we go. Beautiful. And that will just be my short term loop which I create in order to monitor that. Um, and let's have a little bit more look at these waveform statistics because this is how I start every digital master, actually every master in general. I like to look at these peaks because sometimes these peaks are inter-sample peaks and they're only a few samples up and we can generally get away with clipping it um, a little bit without losing much information. So, and this is just all in the setup. I haven't listened to anything yet, and I just do this as general setup. So there's about a decibel there, where there's, that, that would be like five, it's a dozen samples there, a bit under, about 10 samples there, clipping at one decibel. 10 samples in 40, in 96,000 samples, you're not going to hear. So that's just something to be aware of. Negative one, clipping. And that, that doesn't mean I'll necessarily do that, but I just know how far I can go and I'm necessarily not going to hear it at all. Um, the next thing is I want to gain down this main one here, six decibels, because not that I am using my analog gear, leaving the box, and not because I'm going to use any analog emulations in particular for this master. I just like starting at negative six because it's just how I have my whole chain set up typically when I'm putting things in. So negative six decibel true peak, I've made that. I know that I've got about one decibel of clipping, which I can get away with pretty easily without damaging too much of the audio because those are just small amounts of samples that we can sort of consider removing. Uh, or getting rid of, and that's going to buy us headroom to make it louder. Now, I know this isn't a loudness competition because the analog master, that's not really a fair comparison, but what I'm going to really try to do here is create a master which, uh, or master this so it is very loud, but also still comparable to a dynamic analog master. So that, that's one of the benefits of digital. We can manipulate the audio in very precise manner um, and not compromise it, whereas in analog, it's very hard to sort of gauge how hard you can drive something. And you can drive things pretty hard in in the analog world, um, but you can't do it to like the 10th of a decibel or the, 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 the point oh ten or like the hundredth of a decibel like you can in the um, digital world. So let's, so we've got that up. That's sort of where I like to start. So let's just have a listen back to this and then we'll decide what we're gonna do. Yeah, so that clipping, if anything, it might even help just tame some of those claps a little bit because on every third or fourth clap, there's a, a few layers there and they get a little bit too pokey, to my ear at least. And the reason why I'm clipping first is because this is something I didn't used to do. Um, I didn't always do, sorry. I used to clip before my limiter and then limit, but then after trial and error, and even some people cluing me on here in the YouTube comments, because this is sort of a learning experience using the YouTube channel for me to explore things, um, clipping before I start my chain has actually proven better results because I have consistent dynamics feeding all my dynamics processes thereafter. So if I'm going to do any clipping, I now do it up front, not towards the end of the process, and I'm able to get much more open sounding results um, as, as a direct result of that. Now, the clipper I'm using is standard clip. It is just hard clipping. It says soft clip classic, but it doesn't become a soft clipper until we use this slider here. So any free hard clipper will do the same thing. Now, because I've gained stages down negative six decibels and I said I wanted to take negative one, I've just shaved negative seven there. So that's negative one overall and then gained a backup one decibel. So it's negative six decibel true peak there. So that's not going to make a huge difference to the sound. It's just going to buy me some headroom for when I want to push it later down the track. But something I do want to have a look at is the lowest fundamental because I want to just tame that 
I want to compress the top end, but I don't want the low end to, to move it. So let's just have another listen and a look. That kick drum is beautiful and soft and round, and it actually goes down, if you look at this spectrogram here, all the way down to 25 hertz. Um, now, what that means is compression time, I don't want to be too fast, because those are low fundamental frequencies, fast compression is going to break them up very, uh, quite a bit. So, I have a, a compressor set, a set of compressor settings based on um, the lowest fundamental. I've got a video on how I calculated those, even though I did the calculations wrong. Um, these presets actually do me pretty well in terms of getting me in the ballpark that I want. So 25 hertz was the lowest fundamental, which means from two octaves above that, which is 100 hertz, it has a first order octave filter there. Slow attack and release time based on the cycle, the time cycle of a low fundamental frequency of 25 hertz. Um, and this should just help gel and glue um, this overall mix. It's gonna be The low end, the mid range, the low mids all sound super solid, like just in a perfect pocket. What I'm thinking of is a bit of air to the top end stereo, just because I'm hearing those shakers and it's like, it's, it's a cheap trick, but it works and it brings space and sort of will help wrap around an already solid mix just to bring a little bit of air to the sides a bit. Just want to listen and make sure I'm making the right decision here. It's gonna be Oh, that is awesome. I really like that because I'm just going back bef the the compare, which is the original mix and the master there. And the low end feels a bit more bouncier because we're, we're it's not affecting the compression. It's just this really cool movement. Oh, it sounds great. Sounds great. Uh it's gonna be Interesting. I know I said I was going to drive this 
hotter. And whilst this mix is in a tight position and I can absolutely drive this super loud, um, I'm going to show a bit of restraint because stylistically, I feel like everything dynamically is sitting in a really good pocket. So just a little bit of limiting, if any at all, to bring it up to volume is needed. Let's have a look here. Uh, what are we going to use? I'm going to use a maximizer. We're going to use classic mode. Now, here, here is a little note about the IRC different modules. Okay, so we've got IRC4. Now, classic mode is IRC... Pretty sure IRC1 with particular psychoacoustic filtering and modern is 2 and 3 is transient with the 4's filtering algorithm. I'm 99% sure. I, I document this properly in the IRC video. Um, I just can't remember it off the top of my head. He clarified that IRC4's transient mode is actually built on IRC3's pattern. The classic mode is built on IRC's one algorithm, and the modern mode is built on IRC2's algorithm. The only difference between IRC4 is that it uses spectral shaping ahead of the psychoacoustic modeling each of these IRC algorithms use. The reason why I'm going to go classic is because it's a less aggressive mode, and I'm going to use a relatively slow character because the, the faster the character the more permissible distortion it allows back into the signal and the slower the less it does so that's what i'm going to use you can use true pick limiting because it's a little bit more accurate and i reckon we're just going to be able to bring this up in a nice fashion let's have a listen it's gonna be all right So how loud is this overall for this passage? It's gonna be right. be be 10.9 luffs, not super loud at all. That's the integrated value of that passage there. Not loud at all, actually, period. Um, have I going to level match that? to this original down the bottom, just by taking this first passage here's short-term LUFS. Perfect, so now they're level matched, and let's have a listen to before and after. don't like something here, and I think I know exactly what it is. All right, a little bit of tweaking to be done. It's just, it's just feeling a, it's, it's tight and it's together. It's just sluggish, and that I do not like. And that's, that's important. We have to recognize that. It's gonna be
think I'm, I'm I'm liking that little little bit of movement a bit better in the upper mids because what was happening was this compressor it was gelling everything, but it was losing a little bit of that that outward of the speaker movement um, around that mid range, that two k ish mode range. Sorry, so just using a little bit of dynamic expansion there. Just to, just to pop it up every time that snare hits. Anything dynamic or transient hitting, just want a little bit of upper mid energy from it. And if we go before and after, there's, there's, a, decent, there's a decent difference there now. So it's, it was a subtle move, but it creates enough of an effect for me to feel confident in making the comparison. It pops much more. And on the softer here. Much better. Right, so thank you Canon M50 for having a maximum record time of 30 minutes. Um, went up, had a coffee, came back, had another listen, and then started making some changes. And I just made a few extra tweaks to this master, which I feel gets me in a better ballpark. Um, I've pulled down the lower mids by 0.5. I've opened up the Q value of this expander and I've brought down the top end high shelf down a bit. However, I've made it stereo, not just the side signal because I kept playing it back between that and the compare and it was really weird. It just, it just didn't sound right. So again, I'm just circling back around trying to get this spot on and I think I'm in a better ballpark at the moment. Let me just level match again. Okay, let's circle that background and have another listen. It's gonna be Listen to that nice smack there. Let's make sure we're treating that right. Because like I said, this mix is in a really good spot. It's just about giving it the right amount of juice. That little bit of air really just helps it. I didn't need two and a half decibels like I originally had. But before we listen to Wills, he sent me a snippet of him going through the analog chain for you guys to watch. So let's roll that. Hey everybody, my name is Will Borza. I'm a mastering engineer at Howie Weinberg Mastering and Borza Mastering. And I have a YouTube channel, The Analog Vlog, which I'm sure Nick is going to put somewhere. So Nick has challenged me to a mastering duel. Uh, but the rules are a little interesting. He can only use digital equipment and I can only use analog equipment. Let's dive in. I'm not going to lie, I feel a little bit like I'm at a disadvantage here which might be interesting for some of you to hear. Let's talk about some pros and cons of mastering with analog equipment. Con number one, loudness. I'm not going to win any loudness wars using analog equipment only. There is no analog anything that can compete with FabFilter Pro L2, Ozone Maximizer, etc. Loudness is a game for the digital world to dominate. So I've chosen to master this song to minus 14 luffs, which will take full advantage of the dynamic range allotted to us by streaming services today. Another con of mastering analog is it's very invasive. Analog comes with noise, it comes with hums, it comes with stuff, and if a song doesn't need much, just running it through your converters could do more damage than good. On a similar note, this could be a con, this could be a pro, it sort of depends on what the song's doing, but uh, no left and right channel are ever exactly the same in the analog world, so that's going to cause stereo discrepancies, which could be awesome. It could make things fall apart. Let's get into some pros, though. 
pros for analog. Analog is inspiring. There's this guy, Joshua Bell. He's a famous violinist. He plays on a 300-year-old Stradivarius violin. It's been scientifically proven that modern violins project better and audiences really can't hear a difference. But why does Joshua Bell continue to play the 300-year-old Strad? Because it inspires him. Working with analog equipment inspires you. And one of the pro, there's this permanence of taking ones and zeros and turning them into electricity and then changing that electricity and then recapturing that electricity as ones and zeros, different ones and zeros in real time. It causes you to slow down and commit to the sonic choices that you're making. When working in digital, there's less of a perceived consequence of not just getting it perfect because you can always go back and tweak and rebounce and tweak and rebounce and tweak and rebounce. Analog, that's not the case. So it's a different mindset and I like that mindset. Regarding this song specifically, here's some of the things that stood out to me about this record. Firstly, this is an amazing performance, arrangement, recording, mix, all around really great production. So anything I do should be very minimal so that I don't step on anybody's toes. Uh, in cases like this, I try to stick to, uh, I call it rule of two. Um, no more than two decibels in any direction, tonally or dynamically, uh, in terms of gear or color boxes, no more than two of them, rule of two. Or if I do need to go more than two in any direction, I'll probably make a phone call first to the artist, the engineer, and say, hey, uh, this feels like really dark. Is that intentional? Oh, it is intentional. Okay, so I'm not going to use the $8,000 EQ to do something that they don't want. That being said, okay, tonally, I think it could stand to be a little bit brighter, and dynamically, it's great, but a uh, little bit of like very moo hug might give it a real vibe. So let's turn to the gear now and talk about what specific choices I made here. All right, so the first thing I'm doing is I'm gain staging. The first box in my chain is the Manly Massive Passive Mastering Edition. It is a sweet, sexy, silky beast of an EQ that just completely falls apart if you don't feed it enough headroom. So I'm taking this track down about 15 dB. So like the loudest peak is minus 15. The first thing that happens is the sound goes out of my new converters. That's the Apogee Symphony Mark II 16 by 16 special edition. I actually got this so that I could start doing Atmos mastering. And uh, it has also become my stereo mastering converter. It smokes all my other converters. So let's talk about the Massive Passive. Uh, I'm using two shelves. I have a low shelf, four clicks up, nice and wide at 120, taking everything 120, I guess below 120 down uh, about half a dB. I have a high shelf up five clicks, also wide, doing th uh, 330 hertz and up. It's bringing it up uh, to a maximum of 1.5 dB, I believe. I've also put in a 27K low pass filter because I feel like that frames the song really well. After that, we're going into the Thermionic Culture, the Phoenix Mastering Plus, which is a gorgeous, big, round, very moo. Uh, I love it for this kind of stuff. Um, this is giving us back the headroom that I took down to get into the Massive Passive. Uh, so this is starting with 15 decibels of gain into some really nice Mullard valves, tubes. Attack 3, release 2. I like that they keep it simple. The threshold's uh, nominal at 0. It is unlinked. The side chain is far to the right, which means that it's basically completely ignoring all low end, and it's really compressing based on what the vocal is doing. So then it's just back into the symphony. Captured, I kind of played it over and over and over and figured out the output so that uh, I could read exactly minus 14 LUFS on the dot, and that's what I printed it at. All right, so that's the chain. That's my thoughts about the chain. Obviously, I'm not going to win any sort of loudness competitions with an all-analog chain, but hopefully I optimize sort of the tone and the dynamics. It feels great to me. I hope you enjoy as well. Back to you, Nick. So let's have another listen, digital first, then the analog. It's gonna be
So there you have it. One master done digitally. Again, a little bit of soft clipping just to tame the transients, some properly timed compression based on the lowest fundamental. Um, and again, I've got a video to that. There's a link in the description and then just some careful select EQing. Now you gotta remember this is a solid mix to start off with. And then of course, some limiting at the end. I prefer, um, there are qualities I like in the analog one and, but they're not necessarily qualities of my style in terms of mastering. I'm a bit more like loud, proud, make things smack. Um, which isn't really what this song calls on. And I do like the digital master a bit more because it portrays some of those qualities. The analog is just, it, it is a really super sweet sounding. The, the stereo field is, is, is quite interesting the way what, what's actually happened with the analog master there, at least to my ear, it just feels a little bit more, the mid range feels a bit more lush and that's at least my takeaways. So that is my digital master done. It's dialed in, it's in a pocket where I feel sitting good. So there you are, mastering digitally versus mastering analog. These are the steps I take if I'm just mastering digitally completely. I tend to work hybrid, but there are times where I will just, a record doesn't necessarily need to go into all the hardware units. It just needs a little bit of tickling. It's a little bit of movement to get it in the right spot. And I'd rather do that digitally rather than adding conversion processes in the chain and potentially deviating away from the original intent of the mix. Um, it, was, it was a great, fun video to put together. If you enjoyed it, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. And until next time, take care.